Hey y'all, welcome back to the Corax and Coffee Cast. This is uh, Season 2, Episode 6, I think, right Rick? That's correct. And as always, we're all about bringing new people into the hobby. And we're about pushing back hard against that stereotype that LARPers and nerds are asocial beings. So we want to, as always, thank our behind-the-scenes people, our producer Keegan King, um, our kind of game enthusiast consultant Miss Shaw, as well as other people who are behind us. Today, we're going to be talking specifically about LARPing, which is kind of a departure for us because, you know, typically we're talking about tabletop games and LARPing. I mean, I don't know, Rick, can can you LARP at the tabletop? Are there tables in LARPing? There's definitely tables in, in LARPing. Uh, there's certainly some LARPing to be done at tabletops, but... There's a lot of walking around the table and off into the woods somewhat nearby the table. I mean, you could have a table and like being, you know, plotting the deaths of other of the other LARPers, fictional deaths, right? At yeah. a table with ale. I don't I don't know. Sure. I mean, it's a good place to go over notes and all that jazz. But we thought it was really important to dedicate this episode to LARPing because even gamers like hardcore tabletop gamers are like, oh, LARPers, we don't, I don't want to do LARPing, we don't do LARPs or all that stuff. But there's actually, again, still a lot of overlap between LARPing skills and tabletop gaming skills. And there's actually a lot of overlap between people who enjoy both hobbies. Mm -hmm. And we want to just talk about the fact that gamer or no, believe it or not, everybody who's past the age of, I don't know, three, not only knows how to LARP, but LARPs whether you realize it or not. All the time. And LARPing actually has a number of benefits that we're going to talk about and skills that you develop while you're LARP that you can transfer to real-world applications and vice versa. And in LARPing, everyone is kind of on the same team in, in you know on one side of like this awesome, immersive world. Exactly. We're going to talk a little bit at the end about how you can't have an awesome world unless you're working to build everybody up. But first of all, I worry that a lot of people decide not to try LARP, and of course other games, because they feel like they don't know how. They don't know how to role play as a new character, or improvise reactions to new scenarios. They don't know how to be consistent when they're being a new character, stuff like that. I'd like to talk to you today about how that's nonsense. Really, you've been doing all these things your whole life. It's just when you start thinking about doing them in this new context, in the woods, in a costume, that it gets weird. But really, you've already done all of these things in a lot of new contexts already. And Rick, I'm actually realizing as you're saying this that we haven't even defined LARP. We haven't even explained what LARP means as an abbreviation. Mm -hmm. So why don't we do that? Do you want to do that? Sure. So LARP stands for Live Action Role Play, and it's separated from most tabletop games by the fact that you have a lot of your body involved in it. Instead of rolling an attack roll to hit somebody, you just reach out and whack them with a foam bat. Instead of trying to hide using a skill roll or something like that, you just climb into a cupboard and see if you fit in there. If you've ever, you know, been on a family picnic, you know, for a birthday party or been driving down the highway and you see a bunch of people kind of like out in the woods with like um, those foam pool noodles or whatever else in in whatever it's like uh, that's a group of people who are probably LARPing in one form or another mm -hmm. and it's great <laughs> yeah Rick we were talking about how people have been LARPing their entire lives whether they realize it or not mm -hmm. and you know three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds are playing cops and robbers and you know maybe that's not a great example given the times, um, but sure the cops and robbers equivalent. I mean, playing house, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Having a tea party, playing house, playing superheroes maybe nowadays. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like if you are taking on the role of a character, be it a cop or a robber or you know Captain America, whether or not you have a costume and your friend is you know Iron Man or Red Skull or whoever, and you're teaming up or battling it out. In you know taking on these roles, hey, guess what? You're LARPing, <laughs> mm -hmm. and three olds and four four year olds do it, and you could even make the argument that, and I might you can disagree with this if you want to, mm -hmm. that if you're if you're playing with action figures and kind of role playing the action figures, that's just really LARPing with a prop. Yeah, definitely. If your hand ever comes in and smashes the building, as you know, of course it does. 
Right. And and even if not, you're doing a lot of, you know, oh, the Legos are flying around. They're doing these things actively. And I'm really glad you mentioned Legos because I was a huge fan of Legos growing up. And I shouldn't just say was and growing up because I'm still a huge fan of Legos. Um, but I've got a house full of Legos. And he's mostly stopped growing up. Oh, <laughs> uh, well... Let's not worry about that. The point is, <laughs> the point is, <laughs> is that when I was much younger, I loved not only building with Legos, but I loved playing with Legos. You know, I would give minifigures and robots that I would build names and personas. And I really liked, you know, having the Legos, Lego minifigures or whatever, have fights or try and cooperate in some way or build something. And I would even actually role play out loud with myself, my Lego minifigures building their equipment out of Legos, which I get is very meta, yeah. but it works for me. <laughs> and I still love building with Legos now. All cards on the table, I love playing with Legos still, mm -hmm. like I did when I was a little kid. And I feel silly doing it. But there's no reason why I should. If I like role playing with Legos, like what's the issue? Yeah. As long as I can, you know, take a shower, brush my teeth, and go to work. <laughs> like, and that's a type of kind of prop larping mm -hmm. in my basement or wherever. Definitely using a lot of the same skills. Exactly. But we mentioned earlier that even folks who are not gamers LARP all the time, and I'll stand by that. Yeah. So let's take a step out of the realm of play for just a second. In every job I've ever had, I curated my personality. While I was in the Air Force, it was the salutes and holding the coffee cups in the left hand and the walking with my left foot first. Rick was still under there, beneath Airman Hendricks, but he was reflavored to thrive in the military. I do it today. In locksmithing, it's vocabulary. I tell you that you need an entry function knob with the residential back set of two and three eighths because saying the handle with the little button with the shorter thing on the side makes you doubt that I know what I'm talking about. Now, when I see where you, that you're confused, I switch back to the other phrasing, but using the right words right off the bat lets you know that you've come to the right place and I know what I'm talking about, even when I don't. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work with handicapped adults and when I did that job, I dialed my compassion and my patience way up. I don't, I think you're an exceptionally patient, compassionate person. Like you have to deal working with me day in and day out. See, I like to think you're right. I like to think that the compassion is there, but in certain contexts, it has to really come to the fore. And, and that was certainly one where I said, oh, okay, this is the slice of Rick that is coming forward right now. So I only say this to say, I've been many different people for work and I'm betting that you all have too. Each of those people have been pleasant to be around, as charming as they needed to be, and well adapted to their setting. Being a new character and inhabiting a new character doesn't have to be any different or any harder than that. It is a little bit different because your goals are different, but again, that's been the same for every one of these other situations you've adapted yourself to. So for LARP, instead of hiding your tragic backstory, go ahead and add one. Or if you don't feel comfortable adding one, be vague about your past. You can get a real surprising amount of mileage out of just refusing to answer a question that doesn't have an answer. And that just opens you up to a whole world of subtext, which is really, I mean, the spice of any conversation, whether it be in your regular life or in a play or whatever. Yeah. The the mystery that somebody else would put in to what you said, because instead of saying, I don't know, you said, would you shut up and help? There's a wolf chewing on my leg and you're sh sketching out my family tree. Just leave them room to think you're cool. And, you know, as long as you don't say too much, they, they will think you're cool, right? Absolutely. Rick, as you know, back in the day, mm. I, I was a theater kid, right? I spent a lot of time on stage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have many th theater credits to my name. I was quite fortunate in that way in school and community theater. But whenever I would take on the role of whoever, you know, Oberon from, you know, Shakespeare or Inspector Hound from the real Inspector Hound or, you know, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Sure. I would be enrolling this character, but me playing Inspector Hound would be entirely different from anyone else playing Inspector Hound because the character that emerged, of course, was an amalgamation of what the playwright had written and what the director wanted and what I wanted as the person enrolling the character, right? It's an amalgamation of all of these things. Mm -hmm. 
And you're always still under there, yes. I'm always still under there, giving part of who Pete is to this particular iteration of Inspector Hound. And so you were talking about being versions of yourself or LARPing at work, and I think that might not hit everybody quite right because we are in an era of like being authentic to yourself, which I think is such an important movement and, you know, not, not mm-hmm. being disingenuous and not putting up, putting up with things, putting on a facade that you don't want to, uh, in, in situations that you don't want to have to deal with mostly toxic, toxic situations. But right. I certainly right. Don't not, wanna... not letting yourself be ground underfoot. Right. Because you're playing the stooge. Exactly. And that's not what we're talking about here. That is like, we certainly believe that it is critical to advocate for your authentic self in those situations and not be the stooge and pull yourself out of toxic situations. Not that I want to throw that term around, Mm -hmm. but I want to be very clear that when we're talking about taking on a character in the workplace, in your real life or anywhere else, those are not the context that we're talking about at all. No, but I, I also don't think that most people are the same person when they're out partying and when they're visiting their grandma. Of course not, right? <laughs> they're, they're very similar, maybe. Again, you're, you're still a good person in both contexts. But, you know, I swear less around grandma. Yeah, well, well actually, I swear more around grandma because grandma is, is amused by that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. But, you know, yeah, when you have two groups of friends get together, worlds collide, right? You have to pull that group aside and be like, hey, you know what? This other These people don't know that I drink. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but just the fact that we sort of have to be on guard against this. Right. And we do. You, you, you don't want to lose yourself. But just the fact that we have to be on guard against this demonstrates how easy this comes to most people. You know, it's a survival tactic of I'm going to be a slightly different version of myself. Yeah. Because it plays better in this audience. And and sure. so when you go out to LARP, you're not going out with skills you haven't used before. You're just going out with skills that you maybe haven't examined in this light. And specific skills that you're bringing to bear on a certain situation. They're, they, they're curated in a way because you're attending to a specific activity. Right. You mentioned, you know, the tragic backstory. Mm-hmm. I think you, one might find that sharing a tragic backstory, whether it be real or fiction or fictionalized, being able to share that tragic backstory in the context of LARPing is not nearly as scary when other LARPers, other people, can accept or identify with it and say, hey, real, you too, me too, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a wonderful point of connection in this fictionalized universe. And in many LARPs that I've been to, you're in this sort of situation where you're throwing yourself into danger. You're doing things that no well-adjusted person would ever do. And that means that most of you are going to have some sort of a tragic backstory, some sort of a reason why you just didn't stay home and become a farmer and make money like you should have made money. Why are you in front of protecting the town from this horde of skeletons. Mm. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> because really it's it's more useful sometimes to be the slightly thorny character to be to have some edge to you, to have some reason why you would do something because fun happens when you're doing things that are not smart. Right. Within a particular context of Foam, foam weapons and, you know, everyone having fun, but... Exactly. Right. But, you know, one character can say to another, it's like, do you have any siblings? And then, you know, another person can say, will you just, will you just shut up and help me? <laughs> like, move this thing. Yeah. Or attack that guy. Or yeah. defend, defend the village or the tavern. E- exactly. You don't have to answer the question just because it's been posed. And if you think about your real life, you probably don't answer a lot of questions. You know, despite the fact that you know the answer. So it's very easy to cover up, oh, I haven't finished making that part of my character with, oh, I'm just a little prickly and I'm just not going to tell you for one reason or another. And because it's a fictionalized drama, you know, so often, I mean, not everybody, especially when you're fighting over a parking space or a washing machine at the laundromat, right? Sure. We, we lean into that conflict, but, but, but for the most part, people tend to shy away from conflict. Exactly. And try and smooth things over, which is good, right? Because we, it's important to be risk averse and be physically safe in these ways. Yes, in, in, in real life, it's, it's important not to fight over the little things. Right. But in LARP, being a fictionalized universe, like a novel, it's more important to lean into conflict, just like, you know, 
um, in a novel or prime time procedural crime drama. You want to lean into that conflict because there's a new environment, and here in this environment, being nosy and you know poking the bear makes it interesting. I think you mentioned this, and getting into people's business is beneficial because that's grist for the mill that other players can play off of and interact with. Exactly. Again, the smart character, the well-adjusted character, is going to walk away from all this craziness and have a wonderful, fulfilling life that isn't fun to roleplay for a weekend. The one who seeks out trouble uh, is going to find that trouble is golden. If someone's out to get you, that means that someone's chasing you. And if they're chasing you, that means you can't be bored. But it's a chase scene with rules. And occasional political ramifications. Right. And the great thing is, if you're still bored, you can go cause some more trouble for someone. And there's usually a wide variety of targets. Uh, there, there, targets abound. And I, I, I think of, of LARP as kind of the ultimate immersive improv show where everybody is both a performer and an audience member. And if that increases your anxiety, fear not. Yeah. <laughs> because as, as long as everyone is safe and having fun, you really can't screw it up. You really can't. You really can't. And again, because you're both a performer and an audience member, you can just decide that this is your turn to be the audience member. If someone's over there being hilarious, you can just laugh at that and soak it in for a while and rest. It doesn't always have to be you who's providing the entertainment. And Eric, we're talking about kind of a, a lot of seemingly abstract things that I, I would argue really aren't abstract. But I want to actually take this back to childhood for a second, just to give some examples mm -hmm. that, that maybe some people can identify with. Sure. In addition to playing house or cops and robbers or Captain America versus Red Skull as a kid, when I was, you know, six and eight and ten years old, my next door neighbor, Stavi and I, created this game. I'm, I'm sure we reinvented this wheel, but mm -hmm. this iteration was our wheel. We created this game called the Mixed Up Game. And in this game, you could take any intellectual property, any fandom, any character from anything you wanted to and throw it into the universe and enroll it and it was fair game. So mm -hmm. in the Mixed Up Game, I could have Captain America and say, Stabby, I'm Captain America now. And he'd so say, great, I'm Starscream from Transformers. And we would have an interaction. We'd role play an interaction, which was you know typically a fight, right? Sure. With foam swords or just, you know, making <laughs> sounds, you know. And then as soon as one of us had beaten the other, we'd be like, oh, well, now, you know, I'm no longer Starscream. Now I'm Megatron from Transformers. Or now I am, you know, Shredder from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Or now I am, you know, what, you know, the sky was the limit. Anything sure. we could think of. And it was it just, it's an amalgamation in this universe. And it was the mixed up game. And we played this for hundreds of hours over the course of years. But, you know, we did that as kids and like... <laughs> Part of me would almost give like my my left pinky to play the mixed up game as an adult. And hey, I could. You could. I mean, I remember in high school when I was on a cross country team going out trick or treating. You were on this team. I right? was. And yes, you were. And we would go out dressed up as a cross country team and trick or treat. And that was our gimmick. Yeah, a know? cross country team with Mardi Gras beads, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And sungla sunglasses at night. <laughs> yeah. And this this trick or treating as a cross country team in high school. I know, like high school is a little bit old to be trick or treating, but we would dress up and we were very polite, and we did it as a team building bonding experience in the middle of the season, right? Mm -hmm. And it, and it got the miles in. It got the miles in. We did. We actually we ran a lot that night. <laughs> yeah. This tradition was actually started by my team captain predecessor, Ed Durow. And uh, you remember, do you remember Ed? I remember Ed. Yeah, he we used to run, run us around on uh, Ed's Fun Runs. Ed's Fun Runs. <laughs> where, where you would come to just a, a, a station that he found and thought of on his own. And suddenly it's, oh, okay, everybody has to crawl under the jungle gym and jump over this. Yeah. Just wild, but everybody went with it. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, so we have to talk about Ed for a minute because you have to understand, Ed was, like, an exceptionally in-shape, 
high schooler. You know, he did martial arts training. He was on the cross country team and a very competitive runner. And he had this like full mouth grin. It's like, oh my gosh, I never want to meet this guy in a dark alley because he will he will end me. And he had this crazy leather jacket. But he was he had a heart of gold. He was a sweetheart. He would never hurt anyone. Like Ed and I hung out a lot. And, um, like, he was the one who introduced me to StarCraft, you know, someday myself. And, like, he had this he had this red van, and one day he and I were driving on it, and we found a toilet out by the side of the road. So he's like, oh, I just want a toilet in my bedroom. And I'm like, why? You can't, like, it, will, it won't be hooked up to anything. You can't use it. He's like, no, it'll be, like, my 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 reading chair to have a toilet in my bedroom. I'm like, okay, Ed, fine, we'll get this toilet and throw it in the back of your van. That's not weird at all. You washed it first, of course. I, I have no idea what Edward did with it. <laughs> Be, being teenage boys, you, of course, thought first of hygiene. Of course we did. I mean, this is a kid where, like, I mean, I first watched The Blair Witch Project at his parents' house, at his house in high school, after dark. And his house was, of course, secluded in the middle of the woods, right? That's where we watched The Blair Witch Project. And then, like, one day he and I were hanging out and he bleached his hair he was a brunette and he, ble- he got a, just a bucket of bleach and he dipped his head in it and then it was bleach blonde and we went downstairs and his mom was like, oh, Ed, it looks awful. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, just a quick shout out to Ed Jero because he actually has been trying for a while to kickstart his own card game. Oh, nice. Yeah, which is really cool. But the point of all this, other than just to, to reminisce and give Ed a, a, a shout out, is that all of these activities, maybe not the StarCraft, but the cross country team and, you know, the Blair Witch Project, everything else, is really just about running around in the woods safely, having a good time, taking on a character or a version of yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I mean, Ed could almost be, I have no idea if Ed's ever LARPed. I haven't talked to the guy in 20 years, but... It wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if he was a hardcore LARPer. Yeah. <laughs> he definitely had all the skills for it. Yeah. But really, it doesn't take much. A- as you were saying, you know, running around in the woods, being goofy, and that's it. And it's really not that, that different with LARP. Even if you come to a LARP and you're barely dressed up, people are still going to support you. Your costume doesn't have to be historically accurate or amazing. I just have to know that I'm looking at armor and an eye patch, and I will roll with it. Right. And anyone who is really succeeding at the LARP will also roll with it because that's how you do well. You don't get to do well by no selling people's bits. You have you have this framework, and you're goofy in the woods, maybe with a unified theme or plot or script. Maybe. Maybe, right. Um, I mean, every every LARP and every LARPing group is different, and that's a good thing, because you want something for everyone. One great thing about LARP is that the game board is a real space. And that means that most LARPs can get away with a really small group of core rules that everybody needs to know. Like, here's how getting stabbed works. If you're stabbed too much, you're dying. If you're dying too long, you're dead. And that's basically all you need to know for a basic character. I mean, if you're stealing things, here's three more rules for that. Oh, sure. And if you're casting spells, who's, here's five new rules for that. Right. And if, if you're brewing potions, you grate the beetle into arsenic and cross your fingers. And, you know, we're, we're not going to tell you how that works. Yeah, not until your face is melting off. <laughs> Much like D&D, you really shouldn't need to read the Paladin part of the rules if you aren't playing one. So the total number of rules you should you need to start should be super manageable. And the way that they do it even more easily than with D&D is most things that aren't inherently dangerous, impossible, or illegal in the real world can just be done. I'm going to be honest, this is my favorite part and the crux of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So many people will say, well, how do I do it, right? Well, you just you just emit behavior, and you will get immediate feedback on your behavior from those around you, just like life. There's really very little need to ask the question, you know, so what am I supposed to do? Yeah. If you don't like the look of that bear, smack it. Or kiss it. Just maybe make sure you know where Mama Bear is. I don't know. Yeah, probably. <laughs> if you've done that... And you don't want to be in this fight. Just run away and hide from it in the bushes. I mean, if you want to steal the treasure while the guards are distracted, just just do that. Yeah. If you're trying to intimidate a shopkeeper into giving you a fail, fair price, well, put on that swagger and see what sticks. Just do the thing and see if it works. 
Rick, I want to go back for a second to how people are in real life. And I'm just thinking, you know where the, the most real LARPs might actually be? Where? High school and family reunions. Oh, company yeah. ho- <laughs> Company holiday parties. Like waiting in line at the DMV, you know, without picking up a stanchion and beating the hell out of somebody. <laughs> Conforming to the rules of the universe you're in. Sure. We here at Corex and Coffee do not now, nor have we ever advocated for the use of non boffer related conflict to solve interpersonal or emotional issues. Let's just say that. Yeah, with one caveat, sometimes dice work fine. Man, I wish that worked in lottery. You know, one out of 20 is better than one out of 250 million. Anyway, don't worry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many of these things you've been training for your entire life. You know how to run, you know how to hide. You don't really know how to fight, but nobody else does either, it's fine. But it's even better than that. You're not alone. And I think for some, one of the barriers to get into LARPing is because it does involve your physical body, it seems like the risk is much higher because you're putting yourself into it and you're putting your your physicality into it. Mm -hmm. And granted that, I mean, to some extent is a concern and some people don't want to be hit with with anything, boff or or not. Like, and I I get that. I absolutely get that concern. That's legitimate. And maybe that means that some LARPs are for you and others are not, depending on the rules of that particular LARP. And it's important to There are definitely a difference between rules of allowable force and LARPs. Right. Some people really like to wail on each other, and other people, like my LARP or Lightest Touch, where if they start wailing on you, you stop the game and you say, hey, what the hell, man? And whatever LARP you choose to join, everybody in that space has consented to being part of that particular space, and they understand that it's just a game, and so that the consequences for failure in that space will not follow people outside of that space. Yeah, exactly. If you fail to make a friend in a LARP, that's not going to follow you outside of that LARP because outside of that game, you are both nerds who consented to run around in the woods. You probably have a lot in common. So a a concrete example for this. In my primary game, I'm a magical locksmith. I am capable of locking people into phone booths for hours at a time. But I'm constantly evaluating how my actions affect your fun. There are only like a hundred people here, so I'd much rather lose this little battle we're having than chase you away and have you not interact with me anymore. I have this very concrete, vested, selfish interest in making sure that you have fun. I mean, and that's that's ultimately the whole point, right? Mm-hmm. And we've we've talked about this before. You know, it's ultimately the whole point, not only of LARPing, but of any other gaming situation, is to have fun. And I, I can't remember exactly what episode it was, somewhere at the you know tail end of season one, right? But if in any sort of gaming context, your goal is to just beat up on the little guy or the newbie, really evaluate <laughs> why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I get it. Some people just want to win no matter what. It's like you know what. Mm-hmm. I wish you the very best. More power to you if you can maintain your gaming group, if you want to win right. some gaming groups, like having that hyper-competitive relationship with other people works for you and others. Mm-hmm. Great. Go for it. No problem with that. But mostly, if I crush you in three moves, you're not going to play with me again. Right. Like It would definitely, like for me, as someone who actually is a fairly competitive person, like I have no interest in playing against somebody who is so much more advanced than me in any game that I can't learn anything from them. I want to be able to learn and improve. And if you beat me in three moves, I'm really not going to learn. Like, there's no point. Yeah. It's like, yes, you are a vastly superior player. Of course you're going to win. We both know it. We don't need to play. Right. And and I'm not going to sit here and be kicked around by you consistently. Right. Unless you're going to teach me something, there's no point. Like, of course you're going to win. Anyway, we're getting away from it a little bit. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. I mean, half the time, the bandit you're talking to is just going to cease to exist once they leave your eyesight in a LARP, right? Right. If a character, if if your character embarrasses themselves trying to fast talk out of a situation, so what? Who cares? Yeah. It's a game. Exactly. And and just like D&D, you fail to, you know, pickpocket somebody, you stab them, you run away, and you're done. You You can move on from there most of the time. So, anyway, now don't tell anybody, folks, but I'm currently masterminding a kidnapping plot based on magic-absorbing pickles. Okay, Rick, A, A, you you just told everybody because this is going on the internet, man. It's written in ink, and B, what the hell are you talking about? So, I was 
trying to figure out this plot that had been dropped in my lap and I didn't know how to do it. And what ended up happening is I lost sleep over it. You know, the game was over for the night. It was starting again in the morning. I was trying to get some sleep. I got a couple hours and then woke up 3 a.m., could not get back to sleep until I remembered that a couple of the new players who just came into the LARP are these big, boisterous pickle people. Uh, they make a lot of pickle jokes. They sell pickles. They want to make magical potions with pickles. Whole lot of nonsense. And I said, you know what? That's exactly what I need because I need I need to tie my horse to a brand and they have a brand. So let me go grab them. And I did grab them and it's going amazingly. I've got 15 people in on the scheme right now and they're all having a marvelous time. And the reason I'm telling you this is you don't have to be serious or competent to do really well. We certainly are not serious or competent. The thing that's really making us most success- Speak, speak for yourself. I am. <laughs> we're, trying to, we're trying to sell a brand here, Rick. We here at Core X and Coffee do believe we have something important to say about the gaming community. <sighs> Our pickle plot is not at all competent or serious. Oh, we're, okay. What's really making us most successful and enjoyable is just the very basics of improv. It's yes and. It's grabbing bored people and giving them things to do and talking them up. And we're we're going to do our thing, you know, in a couple weeks here, uh, hopefully before this airs. And it's probably all going to crash and burn, but that's why I feel comfortable talking to you about it. But anyway, in the meantime, we've been having a fantastic time. So you don't have to have everything taken care of to do this well. You really don't. And you know what? In a LARP situation, like kind of the best thing about it is that everyone in the LARP really wants you and your character to be awesome. So they can be part of that awesome world that you are all co-creating. Everyone wants you to succeed because A, hopefully, I mean, LARPers are typically good people. Sure. Not all, right? Because there's you know more diversity among groups than between them. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of LARPers who are real jerks. Stay away from them. Mm -hmm. You know, stay away from surgeons who are jerks too, right? Right. You know, they're going to sell your organs. But everybody's already staying away from those people. So, you know, uh, you're maybe. probably doing all right. Anyway, don't worry about that. The point is that you're all working together, even if your characters are opposed. Mm -hmm. When you're LARPing and you're up against a gritty, scary mercenary, let's say that gritty, scary mercenary screws up loading their gun. Well, guess what? Now you get to interact with a gritty, scary mercenary who doesn't know how to load, load their gun. They messed something up. But that's okay, because now you have this gritty, scary mercenary that screwed up loading their gun. Who doesn't want to interact with that character? That's awesome. And you play it up, and you make sure that character still looks awesome, even though they messed up. I don't know how many times people have, I think pretended that they don't understand my area of expertise, how many times they've made a place at the table for me. Everybody wants to be at a full table. So when you're kind of an ex experienced, established player and you know that somebody has cool jewelry school skills, you go out of your way to go grab them and bring them into this thing that involves cool jewelry stuff. I mean, if, if they were to no-sell you, pretend you weren't awesome, then they're stuck in a world where boring people are just boring. Yeah. And if they can just pretend that you're terrible, uh, if they want, but beating up a toddler is no fun. Being horribly roasted by the toddler's dragon bath and ripped apart by his claws is a lot of fun. So you pretend that the toddler is scary. You pretend that he is doing everything right and that he is really giving it to you. I mean, and other characters and person's victories can only be as awesome and as real as you are. So they're going to cover for you when you mess up or step out of character or whatnot because they want to perpetuate the story because they want to take that story home with them. Yeah. Nobody wants it all to fall apart. And personally, I do this a lot with New Plate Pole all the time. It's very easy for me, and it costs me basically nothing in character, to take people under my wing, tell them what I know, get them in touch with the local mages on the path to go do the thing that it seems like they want to do. And then when they hit their stride two events later, they're already comfortable talking to me. So they tell me about their horrible curse, and bang, I'm in trouble again. And that's what I'm after. So I don't let people sit there and be 
less than awesome. And if you come out and take a risk and go LARPing, people aren't going to let you be less than awesome either. And I'm thinking about it, it, it's really, you know, if you have a large LARPing group, you have 100 people who write a novel in two days. Mm -hmm. And I'm, now I'm thinking about, hey, we should actually, like, document everything that people do and turn it into a two-day a novel. But, you know, taking on a new project is my kryptonite, so maybe I should just say no to that one. Yeah. So when you come to a LARP, you don't have to pretend to be interesting. You are already, by virtue of just being you, a real person, possessed of countless little details that any author would be proud to give you. Can we put that on a t-shirt? Let's put that on a t-shirt. Uh, maybe. We might have to make it a little more pithy, but we'll, we'll work on it. We'll pare that down. Yeah, all right. I mean, if you show up to a LARP and you just play yourself, who happens to be holding a sword? Well, guess what? You're a fully realized character with complex motivations who is new in town who doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, which is exactly what you were supposed to be playing, right? As long as you don't mention Facebook while in character, you're doing it right. And practice is only going to make you better. Wait, wait, hang on. You can't mention Facebook? So, Rick, what if you're participating in a dystopian, not-too-distant future social media has taken over everything type of LARP where, you know, technology is consuming our lives in a sort of hellscape? Can you mention Facebook then? I mean, I guess you could if you didn't mind bumming everybody out. I mean, aren't we here at Corex and Coffee still on Twitter? Hi, Elon! Elon, you need to come be a guest on our podcast. I mean, it would be really easy for you, too, because you're a master at speaking ridiculous nonsense. Hey, Pete. Yes? What's our legal budget again? So thank you all for listening to the Corax and Coffee Cast. Uh, please like and subscribe and visit our website at www.corexandcoffee.com. That's what I thought. <laughs> Consider supporting us on Patreon or through our merch store. I am your host, Pete Steele. And I'm your other host, Rick Hendricks. We hope to see you at the gaming table or out in the woods very soon. Until next time, take care, all. Take care. Goodbye. For the record, I'm just taking a hard stance. Nobody is too old to trick or treat. It's free candy, and it's something different to do besides, you know, drugs. Just give people candy, but do prioritize the young ones. For the other record, our legal budget isn't great, but it would need to be much better if Egoist Muskrat wanted to be on the podcast. Mostly because I don't think I could stop myself from editing in a bunch of horrible sounds. Like farts. So many farts. Anyway, your host this week, just like every week, so pointing this out isn't that useful. Sorry. Rambling while I think about editing fart noises. Okay, back to it. Your hosts were Pete Steele and Rick Hendricks. Music, production, and general agent of chaos is me, Keegan King. Thanks to all our supporters out there in the world behind the scenes, on the Patreon, linked through Anchor, and consumers of all of our content on coraxandcoffee.com. We've got merch, written reviews, print and play content, all kinds of stuff. You know the drill by now. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, maybe review, subscribe, rate, do whatever. It's a way of supporting us and helping keep the podcast free and doesn't cost you anything but your time. The quote of the week, Oh, cruel fate to be thusly boned. Ask not for whom the bone bones. It bones for thee. Corax and Coffee. Tabletop gaming. Caffeinated.